Well, hello, I'm Shelly Quinn, and we're so glad you're with us today. Our lesson is seeing the goldsmith's face. If you don't understand what that is right now, you will soon. Let me introduce the rest of the family here at the table. My dear brother, Ryan Day. Amen. Always a blessing. I'm talking today about having faith amid the refining fire. Oh, wonderful. And my precious sister, Jill Morricone. Thank you, Shelley. Excited to be here today. Thank you. My pastor, John Loma McCain. Mine is entitled, The Wise. Whether you'll be wise or all the for it, it's up to you. <laughs> <laughs> and then our dear brother, John Dinsey. Thank you. A blessing to be here. Thursday's portion, character and community. Ah, oh, wonderful. Mm -hmm. Jill, would you like to have our opening prayer? Sure. Holy Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus, grateful for the gift of your word, grateful for the gift of your Holy Spirit. And right now we open up our minds and hearts to what you have for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, we're starting on Sabbath, seeing the goldsmith's face. Our memory text is one of my favorite verses, 2 Corinthians 3.18, which says, but we all with unveiled face beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Mm -hmm. We behold in the Word of God the glory of His character and the Holy Spirit takes us from one level to the next mm -hmm. as He develops in us the image of Jesus. You know, the interesting thing about this is New Covenant <laughs> believers don't have a veil that mm -hmm. obstructs the view of the glory of God in the person of Jesus Christ. Remember Moses had to wear a veil because the, there was the fading glory of the old covenant that was based on nothing more than symbols and shadows. But we, by beholding Christ's character, we become we're changed and we become what we behold. So we're transformed. It's the word in, I love the word in the Greek, it's metamorpho. It's to be That's like right. the metamorphosis from mm -hmm. the caterpillar to the butterfly. So our ultimate goal as Christians is to grow in the grace and knowledge mm -hmm. of our Lord and Savior, mm -hmm. Jesus Christ, and to become Christ-like. Right. In the Sabbath's lesson, there's a story from a book Amy Carmichael wrote called Learning of God. And what she did is she took a group of students to see an Indian in India, an Indian goldsmith. And when they got there in the middle of a charcoal fire, there was a curved tile. It was a roof tile. And on that tile, there was a mixture of salt, tamarind fruit, and brick dust. But embedded in the brick dust was gold. So what happened is the fire devoured the mixture. The gold uh, began to separate. All the dross came to the top where he could skim it off. And the goldsmith took the gold out with tongs. And if it wasn't pure enough, he replaced it back in the fire. So each time the gold was replaced, the heat was increased. And the group asked, how do you know when the gold is purified? He said, that's easy when I can see my image mm -hmm. reflected in the gold. You know, we go through trials and God sometimes allows us, He sometimes places in, us in a trial. And I had the thought as I was reading this, when I'm in a trial, am I quick to say, Lord, let me become yeah. more like Jesus through this. I loved an extra thought that was added on Friday from Helen Keller. Here's what she wrote in her book, Leadership. Character cannot be developed mm. in ease and quiet, mm. only through the experience of trial and suffering. Can the soul be strengthened, vision cleared, ambition inspired, and success achieved? Mm. Are you in a trial today? Then just know that God is going to work out something special. Malachi 3.3 3 says, He sits as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He will purify His people and purge them as gold and silver that they may 
offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. Mm -hmm. So just like the precious metals, we're refined. Our character is refined by fire. Trials help us to overcome our character mm -hmm. defaults right. if we are smart. Now, we're going to look at Sunday's lesson in His image. Genesis 1.27 in Sunday's lesson <coughs> says, God created man in His own image. In the image of God, He created him. Male and female, they, He created them. I want to say something. The Bible tells us God is love. Love is the absence of sin. That's what makes God holy. There's no sin. So it is God's nature of love that makes him separated from sin that makes him holy. Now, in the garden, something happened and it occurred to me this way the other day. It's an interesting thought. Adam and Eve declared their independence from God in the garden. Think about that for a minute. They went against his instructions. They said, we don't need you, God. Hmm. And that is the root of all sin. When we declare our independence from yes. God and when sin entered the world and it entered us, it marred the image of our God in us. So this is what, you know, there's a cosmic conflict between good and evil, Satan and the Lord, and it is still unfolding today before mm -hmm. our very eyes. In fact, I think it's heated up. But what God wants to do is recreate us. He wants to transform us and conform us to the image of His Son. God wants to restore this image of Jesus in us. So He gives us a hope and a destiny. Hang on, because here we go. Romans 8, 28 is our hope. It says that God works all things together for good for those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. Are you kidding? My, my children, my husband just got killed in a car wreck. How is God going to work that together for my good? Mm. Well, you can't separate Romans 8, 28, which is our no. hope, from <laughs> Romans 8, 29, which says those He foreknew, He predestined to be conformed to the image of Jesus. So everything that happens, even our trials, our mm. difficulties, all these perplexities and pain that we go through, God is recreating in us mm -hmm. the image of Jesus, making us a little bit more like Him. And I have to say something. Somebody will say, oh, that's for those who are called. It upsets me so when people say God has an elect people. Certain people are called to be saved, certain aren't. Mm. That's not what the Bible says. First no. Timothy 2, 4, God, it says that God desires all men to be saved That's right. and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Second Peter 3, 9 says, He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And Ezekiel 33, 11, God says, As I live, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked would turn from his way and live. And then he says, Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why should you die? Mm -hmm. So those who are described as the called are those who have accepted Christ Jesus, the free salvation that He offers us, but not all accept mm -hmm. the gospel invitation. And God won't violate our free will. Mm -hmm. So here we've got, He's working everything together for our good to create in us a heart, a character like Jesus. You know what? God knows the end from the beginning. He knows every event that's going to happen and He knows how to work it out right. for our eternal yes. benefit. Right. Amen. Now, His foreknowledge doesn't cause it to happen, 
but he knows in advance and he predestined those who would accept Christ to become his children, to become his family, to be justified and sanctified. Our afflictions, what we go through, is the refining of our character. He's like the goldsmith. We're not on a, a little roof tile. He's holding us in his hands. Yes. That's the crucible. And he's going to let us stay in the heat until the dross comes to the surface and he can skim it off. His purpose is that all who are called, all who accept Christ, will be recreated in his image. What is the image of Christ? Philippians 2, 5, let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. He was God. He humbled himself to become a man. He was obedient to the point of death, even the death on a cross. Mm -hmm. So what God wants is that we would regain a humble spirit. And his plan of salvation is total dependence upon him. Remember, claiming or declaring independence from God is how we got in this mess in the first oh, place. Yep. So he's looking for that humble spirit. Jesus was fully dependent upon God. He said, I only do what the Father tells me to do. I only say what he tells me to say. His was a self-sacrificing love. That's what God wants to recreate in us, to get rid of this selfishness. You talk about dross. Mm -hmm. His character is patient. It is tender. And he wants us, like Jesus, that we would live in obedience to the will of God. Mm -hmm. So we're conformed inwardly. Mm. We're transformed, but we're conformed to the image of Christ's character. And at the resurrection, we're going to be conformed to the image of his glorious body. Mm. Romans 8, 14 through 17 says this, as many as are led by the spirit of God, mm -hmm. these are the sons, the children of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Papa, Father. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are God's children. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified Amen. together. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Amen. Shelley, for that great introduction. Praise the Lord. I am Ryan Day, and I have Monday's lesson entitled Faith Amid the Refining Fire. Man, <laughs> this lesson really hit home because, you know, each and every one of us, if you profess to believe in Jesus Christ and you are on that journey, on that path of growth, and you know at some point in your life, if you haven't already, at least you're headed there, but most of us can probably say that we have experienced some type of refining moment in our life. And the question is, can we remain faithful? Can we keep the faith through this refining moment in our life, through the refining fire? Of course, the lesson begins on Monday by taking us to Job chapter 23. Uh, Job is, the, is really the greatest example, one of the greatest examples uh, when it comes to, uh, you know, talking about keeping the faith through the fire. This brother went through it all. This brother experienced so much. And um, and in, in, in chapter 23, Three really records a, a special a record here of you know the the heaviness that's on upon the heart of Job, but yet at the same time, even though in his groanings and his murmurings and his complaints, you know as he's wondering why and, and he asking all of these questions, he still expresses his trust, his faithfulness in God, even though there are so many unknowns, so many question marks as to why this is occurring to him in his life. Let's begin reading there in verse one, and we're going to read through to verse ten. So this is Job. 23, and we're going to read through to verse 10. Starting with verse 1, it says, Then Job answered and said, Even today my complaint is bitter. 
And then, of course, it says, my hand, this is the New King James Version, my hand is a listless because of my groaning. The original Hebrew here actually should, be, should read, his hand is uh, heavy or his hand is listless because of my groaning. And verse 3 says, oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come to his seat. You know, I could just, I, I can, I could, I feel, I'm feeling this, brother, because there's times <laughs> in life I have said, and I know many, many of us probably said, man, if only I could just see God and talk to him. If only I could just be in his presence and just ask, Lord, why? And maybe just conversate about why are you allowing this? Why are you allowing that? Why do I have to go through this? If only I could just, just meet with him and see him, you know, maybe, maybe I, I, I could, I could make sense of all of this and, you know, I would be extra encouraged, uh, but yet, you know, uh, it's just showing the humanity of Job, but yet he continues on even through the unknowns, even through not being able to see God, not being able to talk to God uh, or hear hear from God verbally, he continues on in his faith. Notice what it says here in verse four. He said, I would present my case before him. He's talking about, if only I could see him, if only I could meet him and be at his seat, I, I would present my case before him. But then notice he says, and fill my mouth with arguments. I, I would know the words which <laughs> he would answer me and understand what he would say to me. Would he contend with me in his great power? Mm. No, but he would take note of me. Mm. It's interesting because Job is acknowledging God's goodness and, and patience here. He's saying, you know what? Even though I'm having to go through this, you know, God, God would know me. He would, he, would, he would hear me out, but yet I would understand his, his, his words. I would understand his judgment because God is patient. God is good. Notice what it continues to say from 7 on to 10. It says, there the upright could reason with him and I would be delivered from forever from my judge. Look, I go forward, but he is not there and backward, but I cannot perceive him. When he works on the left hand, I cannot behold him. And when he turns to the right hand, I cannot see him. And I love this last verse, but I love this, but yeah. he knows the way that I take. When he has tested me, I shall come forth as gold. I love Amen. that. Amen. Amen. I love that. Even though you can kind of sense the humanity and the complaints and the murmuring and the, oh, he's, he's wrestling with this, what's, what's happening in his life. Job still acknowledges that while he can't see or hear God, he realizes that this is all to produce a better version of himself. You know, it takes a, it takes a generous amount of spiritual maturity to view the trials of your life as something positive and worthwhile in the end, my friends. And that's, that's tough. That's tough, especially when you're enduring it. It takes a lot of spiritual maturity to be able to come to the realization that, you know what, this is, this is, this is for the better. This is, this is for good. Uh, that's why I've always been pro, just completely enamored by the words there in James 1. We've read it a couple of times here where it says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. You know, I don't know a single person who really needed to be somewhere on time, but then they had a flat and had to end up on the side of the road. And Oh, praise God that I have this flat, Lord, thank you for this various trial or this, this tribulation or this difficulty or whatever it is I'm going through. Uh, you know, I, I, I very rarely have ever met anyone that, that praises God through their trial, but yet uh, that's what we have to grow in spiritual maturity to understand that it's all for the building of our character. It's all to build patience. It's all so that Christ can see himself in us. Shelly read this text earlier, Malachi chapter three, and I'm going to add verse two. So verses two and three, and I love this because it says, but who can endure the day of his coming. Hmm. Who can endure the day of his coming and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like launderer's soap. And then verse three, he will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. It's interesting. He's, he starts this by saying, who can endure the day of his coming? In other words, it's like Malachi is saying, look, Jesus is coming soon. The Lord is going to come sooner than you think. Will you be able to stand prepared, ready? Will you be able to stand, uh, will you be able to stand confident at the appearing, knowing that you are ready to walk into the kingdom. You know, I found this quote. Uh, it's, a, it's a popular quote we've often heard from Object, Christ Object Lessons, page 69, but it really amplifies the importance of this whole refining process because it says here, Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. My friends, are we ready for that? 
Are we ready for that, for that appearing of Jesus Christ? Because amid this refining fire process, some people are throwing their hands up and saying, mm -hmm. I can't take it anymore. I can't handle mm -hmm. this anymore. And some people fall off by the wayside. They're not, they're not persevering through the faith. And that's the whole point of this lesson is can you remain faithful in the midst of of the refining fire. First Peter 1 verse 7, we've read this many times so far, but it says that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is a lifelong journey. Uh, that's the beautiful thing about sanctification is that we, know it, we, don't, we don't talk about a giant leap with the Lord or a sprint with the Lord, but it is a walk. We talk about our walk with God, but along that walk, oftentimes we find ourselves having to walk through the water, walk through the fire. And that's the beautiful thing I love about Isaiah chapter 43, verse 2, yeah. is that though you may be walking through that fire, though you may be walking through some, some deadly waters in your life, whatever the case may be, God says, you know what, I'm there with you. Even though the refining process may be difficult, even though you may find yourself seeming at times like there's no hope, when is this going to end? Jesus says, I know the, path, I know the point in which you can, I know what you can bear and what you can't. I'm not going to let you be tested. I'm not going to let you be tried. I'm not going to let you be pushed past the point that you can bear. And so I love uh, Isaiah 43, verse two. It says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. I love that. He says, and, and through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flames scorch you. I love that. Jesus says, you know what? I'm going to try you. I'm going to test you. You may have to stand a little bit in that fire, but you know what? It's for the better because I'm going to let you stay in there just in the amount of time that it needs to perfectly reproduce my character, my image in you. I love that. It's beautiful. Noah, there's so many examples in the Bible. So many examples in the Bible of those who went through the refining fire but remained faithful. Noah was the only righteous man on earth during a time of global apostasy, but this brother remained faithful yeah. amid the refining fire. Abraham experienced trial when he was asked to leave his home to be a stranger in the land of Can Canaan. But throughout his life, that brother remained faithful amidst the refining fire. Right. Joseph was, con uh, was constantly ridiculed by his brothers, sold into slavery, and went to prison for something he didn't even do. But that brother remained faithful amidst the refining fires of his life. Moses was raised in a pagan home, asked to remain faithful during Egypt's time of trouble, the ten plagues, and then led an ungrateful group of degenerates wandering in the desert for over 40 years. This brother went through 80 years of refining fire, but he remained faithful through it all. David was called to face a giant nearly three times his size, spent years running from Saul, who wanted him dead, and also spent the vast majority of his life in war defending Israel. That brother spent his life in the valley of the shadow of death, but though he remained faithful amidst the refining fire. Right. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah were taken captive to Babylon. The three, them brothers literally went into a fire, but of course they were, they were tested and they passed the test. They were thrown in a fire furnace and of course Daniel in a den of lions, but they remained faithful through the refining fire. And you just, Paul, Paul is one of the greatest examples. Go read 2 Corinthians 11, 23 through 27, what this brother went through. It's amazing. Jesus what he went through, even though his, or his, his, his testimony and his character and everything was perfect, Jesus still went through the fire. He, rem fire. he remained faithful to his father. The question is, will you remain faithful amid the refining fire? Trust in the Lord with all your heart and he will direct your path. Amen. Amen. Thank Amen. you, Ryan. That was a beautiful lesson. And we've got more to come. Just a quick break and we'll be right back. Ever wish you could watch a 3 Abian Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3 abiansabbathschoolpanelcom A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. And now we're going to Jill Morricone, who has Tuesday's lesson. Thank you so much, Shelley and Pastor Ryan. What an incredible lesson, seeing the goldsmith's face. I love that. I'm Jill Morricone. I have Tuesday's lesson, which is Jesus' last words. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 25. This is, of course, the week before Passover in Jesus' crucifixion. These are some of Jesus' last words to his disciples. He's leaving them. 
and he wants to instruct them how to prepare for when he comes again. Now, the lesson wants us to uh, discuss two of these parables, which we don't have time for. So we're only going to focus on the 10 virgins, which is Matthew 25, verses 1 through 13. How can we be ready for the second coming of Jesus? How can we be ready for his return? We have 10 takeaways from the 10 virgins. Huh? Let's go. We're in Matthew 25, verse 1. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to 10 virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. So who are the virgins? We know in Bible prophecy, a woman represents what? A church. church. And the virgin would represent the pure church, the true church, the church with doctrines in accordance with the word of God. We know in Revelation 12, 17, this woman keeps the commandments of God and has the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is not the scarlet woman who's riding the beast in Revelation 17. These 10 virgins have the word of God. We also see that because all 10 had lamps, did they not? Mm -hmm. The lamps represent the word of God. Psalm 119 verse 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So this end time Bible believing pure church was waiting for the second coming of Christ. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with an end time Bible believing church that's waiting for the second coming of Christ? Takeaway number one, knowledge of God's word is essential for salvation. I'm reminded of Paul writing to Timothy, his son in the faith. This is 2 Timothy 3.15 that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Do you want to be ready for Jesus' second coming? Study His Word. Right. Let's read the next verse, Matthew 25, verse 2. Five of them were wise and five were foolish. Takeaway number two, church membership does not guarantee salvation. Amen. Even membership in God's end time, Bible believing, commandment keeping church does not guarantee salvation. Takeaway number three, outside appearances are not always an indicator of salvation. If you had looked at the virgins, you probably wouldn't have known right off. These are the five wise and these are the five foolish. You would not have seen that. True. The scribes and Pharisees looked holy, did they not? Mm -hmm. But yet they were whitewashed sepulchers. The thief on the cross looked like a sinner and the onlookers looked at him and all they saw was a sinner. But wow. heaven looked down and saw a forgiven saint. That's mm -hmm. right. The sheep and the goats, the goats were surprised. Why? That they didn't make it to heaven. Do you want to be ready for Jesus' second coming? Don't rely on church membership. Don't rely on outward indicators of holiness. Mm -hmm. Let's read the next verse. We're in Matthew 25, verses 3 and 4. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. Now we know oil symbolizes here the Holy Spirit. Remember David was anointed with oil and what happened? The Spirit of the Lord came upon him from that day forward. We also know in Zechariah 4, this is the vision of the lampstand mm -hmm. with the seven lamps. And Zechariah 4, 6, he answered and said, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor or by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Mm -hmm. So the wise had oil in their lamps, but they also had oil, additional oil in their vessels or their flasks or whatever you call it. But the foolish did not have that additional oil. They were unready. Mm. Ellen White says they are destitute of the Holy Spirit. Mm. It reminds me of 2 Timothy 3, verse 5, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. Mm -hmm. From such people turn away. 
destitute of the Holy Spirit. Take away number four, an anointing or infilling of the Holy Spirit is essential for salvation. Church membership in the remnant church is not enough. An outward knowledge of the word of God is not enough. Yeah. Cultural Christianity is not enough. We must be changed. Right. We need the Holy Spirit to understand the word. We need the Holy Spirit to change our characters. I look at the foolish virgins as those stony ground hearers in the parable of Jesus, I think it's Matthew 13, with the sower going forth to sow. Stony ground hearers, a superficial knowledge of God, a superficial knowledge of his word, and yet none of those roots had gone deep. Mm. Do you mm. want to be ready for Jesus' second coming? Receive the Holy Spirit. I like this quote. Though Jesus was bruised in service, he never lacked power. By contrast, you and I, we are rarely bruised, broken or ground in service, but we are usually powerless. Mm. The truth is the greatest zeal and knowledge are useless without God's Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. providing the right perspective, the right attitude and intention for any service we perform. Now the lesson made a connection between, what is the connection between the Holy Spirit and character? but I think they're inseparable. I don't think you can separate the two. The foolish did not have the Holy Spirit, meaning the foolish did not have God's character inside. Amen. And that was due to a lack of the Holy Spirit working in and through their lives. Mm -hmm. Takeaway number five, allowing the Holy Spirit access to our hearts to change us. It's essential for salvation. Do you wanna be ready for Jesus' second coming? allow his spirit to change you into the image of Jesus. Let's read the next verse, Matthew 25, five. While the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. Does this remind you of the church of Laodicea? The seventh church in Revelation chapter three, the lukewarm church. The problem with that church, the Laodicean church, they did not understand their true condition. The foolish virgins probably didn't even know they didn't have extra oil. Even the wise slept, everyone slumbered and slept. Mm -hmm. Takeaway number six, even the most dedicated, Bible-believing, spirit-following Christian can become weary in the delay. Mm -hmm. Do you wanna be ready for Jesus' second coming? Do not be weary in mm -hmm. doing good. Mm -hmm. That's Galatians 6, verse nine. Matthew 25, six, at midnight a cry was heard, behold, the bridegroom's coming, go out to meet him. Mm -hmm. Who gives the cry that the bridegroom is coming? Now this is Jill's interpretation alone, okay? This is just Jill's interpretation of this. We always say there's two groups. We say there's the wise and the foolish, but I think there's three groups. The wise have the Holy Spirit and a deep experience with God, but they become weary and they fall asleep. The foolish are apathetic. They have a superficial experience with God. But the third group is those who deliver the cry those who deliver that message, right. those who say, the bridegroom's coming, everybody wake up. That's right. Verse seven through 10, all the virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, give us your oil for our lamps are going out. But the wise said, no, we cannot give it to you. Takeaway number eight, the Holy Spirit cannot be bought or sold. One's experience with God, one's character cannot be transferred. That's we right. know in Acts 8, Simon tried to buy the Holy Spirit, but it didn't work. Let's read the last couple of verses, verse 11 and 12. Afterward, the other virgins came saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. These are the foolish. But he answered and said, I do not know hmm. you. Takeaway number nine, knowing Christ is essential for salvation. That's right. It's not enough to know about him. We must know him. And the last verse, verse 13, watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the son of man is coming. Watching and waiting is essential for preparation for the second coming. So do you want to be ready for Jesus' second coming? Study his word. Don't rely on your church or outward indicators of holiness. Receive the Holy Spirit and allow his spirit to transform your life. Do not be weary in doing good. Receive the righteousness of Christ, know Jesus. Don't just know about him and watch and be ready for he is coming when you least expect it. 
Wow, thank you, Jill. Wow, that's a perfect segue into why it's important to be wise. <laughs> and mine is uh, Wednesday. Thank you for that foundation. Thank each one of you. Why it is important to be wise. Let's go to Daniel chapter 12 and the writer. And I looked up an article about um, Gavin Anthony. And according to this, he's uh, currently a pastor in Dublin, Ireland, the one who constructed the lesson. And I was very pleased by the practical nature of this lesson but what he brought out is what I want to talk about right now, how important it is to be wise, knowing what is coming. Starting with Daniel 12, and I'm going to read verses 1 down to verse 4. At that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. I like the King James Version who stands in behalf of his people. Mm -hmm. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. Even to that time... And at that time, your people shall be delivered. Yeah. Everyone who is found in the book and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life mm -hmm. and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Those, and this is the focal point, those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel... Shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall increase. Mm -hmm. You know, the question that was asked in the beginning of the lesson is what is the context? What time in earth's history is being referred to? And most importantly, what can we tell from these verses about the character of God's people during these times? What characteristics are given them in contrast to the wicked? This is a time that we've talked about quite a bit but it's a time that's hardly imaginable mm -hmm. because when the servant of the Lord Ellen White talks about this time, looking forward to this time, she says, usually in anticipation, something is worse than it is in experience, but such is not the case. Mm -hmm. The Bible says a time of trouble such as never was. And if you think about the, the um, coalescing together of all the difficulties that humanity has faced, and you think a time is coming that uh, is hardly imaginable. Mm -hmm. It's something that really boggles the mind. You find in the book of Zephaniah, let me just give you an example of the context of the time. Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 14 to 18. <clears throat> and Zephaniah talks about this time of trouble, talks about the context that Daniel introduces. This is the context. This is the setting. If you could put this into a, a mental picture, here it is. The great day of the Lord is near. Zephaniah it is near. One? Zephaniah 1, verse 14 okay. to 18. Thank you. The great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hastens greatly. The noise of the day of the Lord is bitter. There mighty men shall cry out. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of devastation and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness a day of trumpet and alarm against the fortified cities and against the high towers. Then he says, I will bring distress upon men and they shall walk like blind men because they have sinned against the Lord. Their blood shall be poured out like dust and their flesh like refuse. Now, what about those who have a lot? Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath, but the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy for he will make speedle, speedy riddance of all those who dwell in the land. Speedy riddance. <laughs> Two words that you don't often put together. Speedy mm -hmm. riddance. I've right. not used the word riddance in a long time. But look at the time. It's a difficult time that we're facing. However, there's a contrast to that side. This is where the wise come in. Go back to Daniel again. We see in Daniel 12 verse 3. It says, speaking about this time, while men are in distress... What are the conditions of the people of God? Yeah. Verse 3, those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament mm -hmm. and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. So while the world is wrapped in darkness, the people of God are standing forth illuminated by the glory of God. And I think in some ways similar to what Moses experienced when he came down from the mountain. Mm -hmm. His face was so enraptured by the glory of God that they had to veil his face. Mm -hmm. At a time of darkness, when the world is wrapped in darkness, spiritual darkness and physical darkness, not just a physical darkness. Look at Isaiah 60 verse 1 and 2. 
talking about this time that the people of God are going to stand forth. This gives me encouragement because right now my wife and I went down to Southern California once. We were living in California and we went down. Uh, we, we happened to be visiting a friend, but it was around the time of the, of the Oscars or one of those major awards. And we ended up driving through a community where we saw all these black long limousines. Every, there was limousines everywhere. I mean, hundreds of them. And all the windows were darkened. And there was a red carpet. Wow. I think it was by the Kodak Theater. And here we are driving through in a Nissan Maxima. We look like get out of the neighborhood type of look. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like, what we're doing is we're looking to see if anybody would roll down the window because you can't see through it. We're wondering, we know all these people are famous. Maybe we might recognize somebody or even still, maybe they might recognize us. Long before 3ABN, we had no kind of platform at all, but just in our own minds. So we saw someone roll their window down partially and looked out and always saw just the eyes, couldn't recognize who it was. And on the way home, we were just so frustrated. I said, you know, that's terrible. I mean, here we are. These people don't even want to let us see who they, who they are, what they look like. And the Lord tapped me on the back of my head and he said, okay, they live in a world where you can't get in. But one day you're going to be living in a world where they can't get in. The walls of the new Jerusalem are going to be clear as crystal. Mm. And I said, he said, don't worry, you can't see them, but one day they'll see you. And I thought, wow, not judging any of them to be saved or lost, but I thought that's a contrast. That's a time wow. those who are shining now, if you don't know the Lord, you won't shine then. That's right. So Isaiah 60 talks about the contrast, which is what the lesson brought out. Look what it says, Isaiah 60, verse 1 and 2. Do you have it, Jill? I do. Read that for us. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. That's right. So the contrast between the difficulty, which was pointed out in the lesson, what makes the wise wise? It's the glory of God that's lighting upon them. But then where did this wisdom come from? Go to Colossians 3 and verse 16. Colossians 3 and verse 16. We don't just get wisdom because we ha hang around in church, <laughs> but there's something that makes the difference between those who are in darkness mm -hmm. and those who are in the light. Colossians 3 and verse 16. Let's look at that together. It says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. wisdom teaching and admonishing one another in psalm and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Mm -hmm. Singing, Ryan, in grace to your hearts <laughs> to the Lord. Mm -hmm. Now, where does that wisdom come from? The Word of God dwells in us richly. Mm -hmm. And when the Word of God dwells in us richly, notice Psalm 119, verse 130. At a time of darkness, here's where the wisdom comes from. The entrance of your word gives light. That's right. it, it gives understanding to the simple. Mm -hmm. So wisdom comes from the word of God. And then we read in Psalm 119, verse 105, your word is a lamp unto my feet mm -hmm. and a light unto my path. So here we go. At a time of darkness, the people of God are wise, not because all of a sudden they you know, had wisdom rained on them, but they were studying God's word. Yeah. Mm. God's word is the source of wisdom. Yeah. I've been in conversations where people have been, their minds have been, you know, their words boggle me sometimes, but then I find a way to introduce God's word. And all of a sudden you realize that the wisdom of men is really foolishness in the eyes of God. Mm. Yeah. God uses the simple things to confound the wise. Right. The word of God is powerful at that time. And what makes the time of darkness even more comforting for the people of God. Second Peter 1 verse 19, what does the word of God do for those who follow the word of God? Second Peter 1 19 says, so we have the prophetic word confirmed or word of prophecy that is made sure, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place mm -hmm. until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your heart. Notice light is coming. The morning star is arising. Mm -hmm. When we look at prophecy and we forecast uh, through God's word, we're able to say, we know what's coming. Yeah. Then all of a sudden we know what kind of preparation to make. It's not the time that's coming that causes intrepidation, but it's non-preparation for the time that's mm -hmm. coming that will cause intrepidation. If you know what's coming, the best thing to do is to be wise in preparation for that day. Daniel was told in Daniel 12, verse 4, but you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall be increased. At that time, why will it be necessary for the people of God to be in the light? Revelation 18, verse 4. Here's the reason why. In darkness, mm -hmm. the people of God has one final message. 
Revelation, Revelation 18, verse 4. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins and lest you receive of her plagues. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wisdom causes us to be the final light to the world. Amen. 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 Praise Beautiful. the Lord. Well, we have Thursday's portion. My name is John Dinsey. The title for Thursday is Character, Character and Community. And the lesson here focuses in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16. I am going to back up to verse 7, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7. And here we have the words, But to each one of us mm -hmm. grace was given according mm -hmm. to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Mm -hmm. Now let's go to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. And he himself, that is Christ, gave some to be apostles mm -hmm. and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. So it is Christ that gives the gifts. So all glory should go to Christ. Remember that we are supposed to see the goldsmith's face, keeping right. the focus on the goldsmith, which is Jesus Christ, there will be growth, there will be unity, there will be love for one another. Mm -hmm. So uh, here in verse uh, John chapter 1 and verse 16, notice that it is Jesus again the focus. John writes, and of his fullness we have all received and grace for grace. Each mm -hmm. and every one of God's children has received of the fullness of Jesus Christ and grace for grace. So the gifts come from Jesus. Yeah. And as we uh, maintain a close relationship with him, the gift that he has given will be put to the use that God has intended for that gift, not for glorifying self, Right. Not for you to be uh, put on a pedestal, but the Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12, for the equipping of the saints, mm -hmm. for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So the gifts that God has given to each and every one of us is to benefit everyone else, mm -hmm. benefit the family of God. So as we consider Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 and, so, and 12, we can conclude that this is referring, referring to the, the necessity for God's people to be joined together in community. The title for the lesson for Thursday is Character and Community. So the gifts that we, we get, remember, consider for a moment, you're given a gift to be an evangelist, but you live out in a, by yourself in a community I'm sorry, on your own in a mountain in a cave and you're supposed to receive the gift of a pastor or an evangelist, that gift is going to what? You're not going to put it to the use that God intended. You need to come to the community. You need to come together with God's family for that gift to be put to the use that God has intended. Verse uh, 13, Ephesians 4, 13, till we all come to the unity of of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, mm. to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. This is the goal, to the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ, to be a perfect man. And we all need one another to help one another. We need to pray one for another. And the idea of being Lone Ranger Christians is not according to God's plan. You're the Lone Ranger and you're out there by yourself doing all these things and glory to yourself, glory to yourself. That is not God's plan. God's plan is for the church, God's family, to be a body of believers. Mm -hmm. There's a family, the family in heaven and the family in earth are to be united. Mm -hmm. uh, remembering that there's to be the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And when we come together, you know, we... Uh, the, the, the Sabbath school lesson is, is to bring the church community together to discuss the lesson. Yes, you study by yourself, but when you come to the classroom, we're all sharing. What did the Lord show you this week as you were studying the lesson? And we share with one another. We edify one another. As I've been listening here, I've been edified. And I'm sure you have as well. This is why we do the 3ABN Sabbath school panel 
to edify God's family. And we rely upon the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray, we ask for the Holy Spirit because this is all leading us to the unity of the faith. I'm going to read from Steps to Christ, page 101, paragraph 1. God does not mean that any of us should become hermits or monks and retire from the world in order to devote ourselves to acts of worship. The life must be like Christ's life, between the mountain and the multitude. Yes, you need time alone by yourself to uh, pray and to ask the Lord to give you strength and to bless you with the Holy Spirit. But we also need to pray together. We need to sing together. We need to worship together. We need to testify of the Lord's goodness. And as we hear how the Lord is blessing one another, we are encouraged in the faith. Our faith will grow as we Amen. hear how God is leading in the lives of His children. And uh, everyone will face challenges. And we are to come together to say, brethren, pray for me. Uh, even Paul himself, he said, brethren, Pray for us. Mm. We yeah. all need to pray one right. for another. And you know what? There's enough division in the world. <laughs> we need to see the example of unity that God has intended. The world needs to see this. I continue reading. He who does nothing but pray will soon cease to pray. Mm. For his prayers will become a formal routine. Yeah. When men take themselves out of social life, away, away from the sphere of Christian duty and cross-bearing, when they cease to work earnestly for the master who worked earnestly for them, they lose the subject matter of prayer and have no incentive to devotion. Their prayers become personal and selfish. They cannot pray in regard to the wants of humanity or the upbuilding of Christ's kingdom, pleading for strength and wherewith to work. So the idea of a unity of believers is what we should strive for. Notice what Christ prayed in John chapter 17 and verse 11. He said to the Father, And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. Mm -hmm. And I come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own name, those whom thou hast given me. Why? That they may be one mm. as we are mm. one. Mm -hmm. And we should strive to see that prayer answered in our lives and in our community of believers. That's right. So if you're pulling one way, if the, the, <laughs> apo the, uh, the apostles are pulling one way, the prophets are pulling another, the teachers are pulling in another way, <laughs> You will have division, you will have strife, mm. you will have jealousy, you will have selfishness displayed. This is not God's plan. Now I want to go to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14. Notice that we should no longer, apparently, there was a time that people were being, uh, happening what was, uh, uh, we're about to mention, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men, in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. Now this is, you, you can see here that Satan has to be involved in this idea, trickery of men and cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. Satan works through people and he is trying to deceive God's people from following the Lord. He worked upon the disciples. I mean, Jesus Christ was about to be crucified. What were they doing? They were arguing with one another who's going to sit next to him uh, as he went to the kingdom. So we need to be united. The prayer of Christ that we may be one, that we may be one as he and the Father are one. Now, I want to uh, point out that we should all be anchored mm -hmm. in Jesus Christ. And so this is why we, as we come together, we learn more about Christ from one another. I need to move quickly to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. Christ is the head. And by speaking the truth in love as he did, we will grow up as he is. So why does Paul tell us that we should speak the truth in love? Really, how many people do you win by speaking the truth with hate? We need mm. to speak the truth with love, and that is the way you will touch people's hearts through the blessing of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4.16, 
have to get that in. From whom the whole body joined and knit together. These words talk about such a unity that we need to strive for by the grace of the Lord. Knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share, cause, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. We need to strive for this and by God's grace, we shall achieve it. It is needed. Hey, Amen. 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 I have been so blessed by each one of you today and want to just give you a few seconds for a closing thought. Amen. You know, Job uh, strived to and desire to see God. He said, I like, I could see him and talk to him. Uh, you know, even Thomas, you know, he, he doubted that Jesus had, had been resurrected. He said, if only, if I, I have to see him before I believe him. But Jesus says in John chapter 20, verse 29, I love the words, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Amen. Amen. The 10 virgins, the bottom line is we are called to have the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, but to be filled with the Holy Spirit and to allow Him to transform our characters into His image so that we can be ready. And if we are to be ready at that time, if you lack wisdom, James 1 verse 5 says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. God is willing and waiting to supply to you what you need for the times that are just ahead of you. Amen. And I would like to remind you that the disciples by God's grace became of one accord and the Lord wants us to do the same. Pray for one another, confess our sins before the Lord and ask for the blessing of the latter rain. Amen and amen. Well, we are so thankful that you've been with us today. Seeing the goldsmith's face, you know, in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve rejected God's word mm -hmm. and they declared their independence of God. And that's where all these crucibles were initiated. But God will work all things together for your good to make you a little bit more like Jesus. When you walk through the crucible with Him in faith and you want to join us for our next lesson, which is Extreme Heat.